Morning, boys and girls and members of staff. And first of all, thank you very much for making your way to the remembrance ceremony this morning. It was in 1921, the first time that we decided to commemorate the Armistice Day. And for a lot of you will think that's a long time ago and things have happened very, very distant in the past. But the theme of the remembrance ceremony this morning at Hermitage Academy is going to be explaining why it is that these years later we still choose to remember. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be having five S5 pupils coming up to discuss with you reasons why they feel we should still remember. And these are pupils who are studying history in the senior phase, but also pupils who were on the school trip to the battlefields of Belgium and France earlier on this year. And they want to relay with you some of the experiences and emotions that they encountered on that trip. So firstly, I'm going to ask Louise to come up and what we're going to focus on in terms of why we remember is to do it with the lost generation. Um, Essex Farm Cemetery, a resting ground in Belgium that commemorates around 1,308 graves. The cemetery has one very special grave in particular, in which lies the body of a 15-year-old, Joe Strudwick, making him the youngest combatant to have fought in the First World War. When the war broke out in August 1914, Joe visited his local recruitment office in Surrey, England, to sign up as he was filled with enthusiasm to fight in the conflict, even though he was four years too young. The recruitment officers knew he was too young to volunteer and told him to run around the block and come back and say he was 18. Joe done so and became part of the 8th Battalion Rifle Brigade and took part in fighting in the Second Battle of Ypres. Valentine Joe Strudwick was killed in action near Belgium on the 5th, 14th of January 1916. Many young men lost their lives during the war and we now know them as the Lost Generation. As part of the Lost Generation, men like Joe didn't return home to relive the rest of their lives and possibly start families of their own. Uh, I'm going to invite Grace to come up just now, who's going to talk about another reason why we remember, and that's obviously the impact it still has on our culture today. Many of you in doing English will look at poetry and other things, songs inspired by people who endured and survived the First World War. One of those people is John McRae. On the 3rd of May, a hundred years ago, John McRae stepped out of his bunker where he had been operating on his fellow wounded soldiers. He looked out across a makeshift graveyard and being so moved, he wrote down these few words. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row and row that mark our place and in the sky, the lark so bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw in sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be it yours to hold it high. If you break faith of us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. The poppies he saw are the reason we have poppies as the emblem of remembrance today. So, just so you can see what it was that Grace was reading there, that was the, the poem in Flanders Field, which is the reason why many of you uh, are wearing poppies today. It's seen as a symbol of remembrance, so that's obviously why we choose to remember using that particular, um, that particular flower. Now, one of the most enjoyable things about me being a history teacher is that I get to, basically my job, is to tell you stories about things that happened in the past. What I'm going to do just now is tell you about one story that happened on the 1st of July 1916. That's particularly significant for people studying and looking and investigating the First World War because that was the Battle of the Somme. And this is the last Remembrance Day, Ar Armistice Day ceremony to take place before the 100th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme that will take place next year. This is a very momentous and poignant event in our history, our shared history, because this is the single bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, when in the space of an hour and a half, 60,000 men lay on a battlefield dead or injured. One particular story we learned on the trip was about the people of the Newfoundland Regiment. Now, I don't expect any of you to know where Newfoundland is. In 1914, it was a country in North America in the middle of the Arctic Circle. It was people who lived there were fishermen, they were whalers, uh, they lived a pretty tough existence. But when the call came in 1914, they signed up and they decided to fight with the British Empire. On that day, on the 1st of, August, uh, 1st of July, 1916, the Newfoundland Regiment was part of the second wave of attack. They had seen the first wave essentially wiped out, but still they charged across no man's land. 
no man's land being the area between their trenches and the Germans, as shown in the picture on the screen. So 8.45 uh, a.m., the Newfoundland Regiment marched out of the second line trench. They were so keen to get involved, they didn't even wait to get to the front line. So they charged earlier than you would expect against the German guns. Out of that, char out of that, that trench went 22 officers and 758 men of other ranks. By the end of the day, many of those men had died. Huge numbers we're talking about here. Almost 800, all, pretty much over 50% of the population of the school. Now, within the first five minutes of the attack, before they'd even got to no man's land, a third of those soldiers lay dead. Essentially, if you think up here, we're in thirds. A third over at the far wall, you were gone in the space of five to ten minutes. But on these men still bravely went. They charged at the German guns, even though they were the only regiment at that time on no man's land and a target for every German machine gun, still they went on. Ten minutes later, another third had gone, the middle third up here. Imagine that, you'd set off with all of these people leaving your trench in the space of 15 minutes, two thirds dead. Five minutes later, the, Germ uh, the Newfoundland Regiment advanced as far as they had got. Now you might think, given that tale of destruction, that seems quite far. They'd got basically as far as from here to Waitrose. They had hardly moved at all. But in that time, they had lost all but 110 men. So the reason why we still remember just now, and the reasons why in the 1st of July 2016, next year, lots of people will choose to remember, is because of the loss of life that happened to soldiers, but soldiers who before war broke out in August 1914 were just ordinary members of the public. They were butchers, they were bakers, they were school teachers, they were um, ship work, shipyard workers, they were very many variety of jobs, but they died on that day as soldiers. Now, I'm going to ask um, for Emily to come up just now, who's going to speak about another reason why we remember, which is to do with the reasons why men volunteered. Henry Weber joined the army after his three sons enlisted so he could fight alongside them on the Western Front. Weber was also a very patriotic man who believed it was an honour to fight for king and country. On the 21st of July 1916, Weber was taking supplies to build up the Somme offensive when he stopped to talk to a group of officers. Suddenly they came under attack. A German shell landed nearby and Weber along with 12 other men was critically wounded. He was then taken to a dressing station where he never regained consciousness. Henry Weber died one month after his 67th birthday, making him the oldest man to have been killed on the Western Front. The bottom of his grave reads, Pro Patria More, which you may recognise from the Wilfred Owen poem, Dulce de Corum Est. It translates as, For Your Country, showing Weber's patriotism and passion for defending his country, a trait he and many other British soldiers shared. Uh, now, it wasn't just people in the front line that were affected, at home as well, people lives changed and the dreaded thing for any wife, mother, girlfriend left at home was to receive a telegram. Kira is going to tell you about a mother who had that fear intensified. Dartmoor Cemetery in France holds only a small proportion of the fallen soldiers from the Battle of Somme. Buried here amongst the 768 casualties include father and son G. Lee and R. E. Lee. Sergeant George Lee, aged 44, and Corporal Lee, aged 19, both fought together with the Royal Field Artillery. Sadly, both father and son died in the same instant on the 5th of September 1916. One can only imagine the terrible news for the family in Peckham. Frances Lee, the mother and wife of G. Lee and R. E. Lee, did not only receive one telegram, but two. Unfortunately, Frances received one for her beloved soulmate and best friend, her husband, and another for her son, whom she adores and cherished with all her heart. This devastating news that Frances received about not only losing her husband, but also her son, would have left her heartbroken. Sadly, this shows the reality of the Battle of the Somme. Many families also went through the agonising pain of receiving a telegram informing the family that they've lost a loved one. During the Battle of the Somme, Britain suffered its largest number of casualties at 19,200 soldiers dead and 40,000 wounded or missing. As a result of the Battle of the Somme, Britain lost a huge mass of casualties. We need to show our respect to the fallen soldiers who fought for us during 1916. And I've just got one last speaker to come up. 
Uh, that's Megan. Now, a lot of you think, well, this was hundreds of hundred years ago. Why is that relevant today? There are links today in the community all around us. At the main foyer is a list commemorating the people who fell, teachers and pupils from Hermitage Academy, because Hermitage Academy was here 100 years ago, who went and volunteered and died. There will also be relatives of yours who are involved as well. Megan is going to tell you about a link to today. Private H. Spink was my great-great-uncle who served in the 5th Battalion of the Black Watch Royal Highlanders. He died on the 9th of May, Sunday, 1915. He was one of many who fought in the Battle of Champagne, trying to defend our country. I had the opportunity to visit his grave, and this was a few days before the 100th anniversary of his death. Being the first family member to visit the grave was a special moment, and it made me thankful that he actually had a marked grave. We then went to Pocapelle Cemetery in Belgium, where we discovered that 80% of the graves were unmarked, meaning there was no name to the body that lay beneath. This shocked us all as we realised that these people will never have the privilege of a family member to pay their respects. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all five girls who came up and spoke there. Uh, what we're going to do just now is have the two minutes silence service, so chance for you just to reflect on yourself if you have family members in the forces or not. I just ask for you to stay silent for the, two, the entire two minutes. Um, and then we'll have a few people play the last post as well. Okay, I will put on the screen too just the words to the poem The Fallen, which has became, become for the British Legion the kind of mantra of why we still remember. So thank you very much. Okay, folks, thank you very much for your patience and um, kind, attend, uh, kind attendance this morning. First thing, because it would be appropriate just now, and uh, then the service is complete, can you give a round of applause, please, to our five speakers who came up this morning?